Hello, and welcome to 24 Hours of Reality. My name is Lizzie Kendrick, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Communications and Digital Strategy for the Climate Reality Project. I'd like to welcome you to our first global dialogue exploring the tra just transition issues across the planet. This year, 24 Hours of Reality, Spotlight on Solutions and Hope, aims to highlight all the incredible progress people of all ages and walks of life are making in our fight to stop rising temperatures and build a healthy and sustainable future together. This is a day to share stories and ideas, to learn what works and how we can make a difference, to find hope and inspiration, and then go back to our own communities and get to work. We design these global dialogues to help drive this process and share ideas and inspiration from advocates across fields and continents so that together we can learn from each other and build a stronger movement to win. I'm really excited because we have a terrific panel for you today to get this conversation going. First, I'd like to welcome Masayoshi Ayoda. Masayoshi specializes in climate communications and is actively involved in many climate groups in Japan. He's also a trained climate leader in Tokyo in 2019. Today, he'll be talking about his work with 350.org Japan on shareholder proposals and people's action to demand Japanese megabanks to transition to clean energy, as well as his work with the Climate Reality Project Japan Energy Transition Working Group. Next, we'd like to extend a warm welcome to Goshia Reeklink. Goshi has worked both in the private and non-governmental sectors on programs, specializing in both communications and development. Also a trained climate reality leader, Goshi will be talking about climate reality leaders work in the just transition programs in Europe. I'd also like to welcome Angela Johnson to the panel. Angela is an environmental justice advocate in Memphis, Tennessee in the United States with a deep investment in the prosperity of her community. Her work is, has been heavily rooted in youth development and she genuinely believes that children deserve access to caring individuals, safe environments and creative outlets for healthy development. Now to get things going, I am honored to introduce someone who knows a thing or two about driving the climate conversation, our founder and chairman, and former United States Vice President, Al Gore. Well, thank you, Lizzie, and hello. Uh, welcome to our first global dialogue of this year's 24 Hours of Reality event. We call it a spotlight on solutions and hope. The recent progress on climate action that we've witnessed this year has been powered by the passionate work of activists all around the world. Today, we're shining a light on the positive impact that uh, these are achieving in their communities. And in this first of four global dialogues, we're focusing on the importance of a just transition to clean energy. The power sector alone generates 26% of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. The burning of oil, coal, and methane is not only polluting our planet, it's sickening frontline and fence line communities. Shifting to clean energy leads to numerous benefits. It reduces emissions, leads to cleaner air and water, and stimulates the economy by creating lots of good new jobs. So we're about to hear from three inspiring individuals who have seen the challenges of living near fossil fuel infrastructure firsthand and who have worked towards a just transition to clean energy in their own communities. So let's, uh, let's jump right in. Uh, first of all, um, I wanna ask why is a just transition important to your community and to the location where you live? Angela, why don't you kick things off if you would? Um, well, first, uh, thank you. Um, it is an honor to be here. I wanna say that first off top. Um, as far as just transition and how it's important to my community, um, I want to start off by saying that I grew up in a community uh, that has a history of being plagued by facilities that use fossil fuel to for their production. 
Um, growing up, I did not know this myself. Um, returning to live here as an adult some years later, uh, I still did not know fully of the issues that these facilities um, pose. I, I knew about them, but I did not know the magnitude of the situation. Um, it was not until I learned of the Bahia Pipeline project that was coming through my community um, that I decided that you know enough was enough. Uh, I think at that point it was the pipeline and prior to that, uh, my neighborhood had been experiencing multiple days, sometimes days back to back, of foul odors in the air and it will remind you of some days that smell like rotting eggs and then some days um, you will smell something that remind you of burning tires or rubber and mm -hmm. i think i personally had just enough is enough so learning about how hey, your pro pipeline project it was time to figure out what i could do as an individual to take some form of action so um to me, it will boil down to uh, just transition is uh, we if enough, the time has come for it's enough of enough of using or um, allowing these companies to operate in our communities. Um, they are usually when they create these projects or they have a new build out, they're going through communities that are disenfranchised. They are going through communities um, that are currently already overburdened by other socioeconomic factors. And they are likely, they are communities that have higher amounts of residents of, that are people of color. So a just transition for my community, for my neighborhood would essentially equate to liberation from these types of fossil fuel companies. So that preventing them, preventing them from wreaking any further havoc on our communities. Well, thank you, Angela, and uh, what an inspiring victory for your community in Southwest Memphis. I, I had a chance to witness and feel the passion in, the, in your struggle in the communities that struggle against this pipeline, and what a wonderful victory. But the struggle goes on because not all of the environmental insults have been removed. Uh, and any, anyway, thank you so much uh, for getting us off to a great start. Let me move on. Uh, what do you see as the greatest challenge to overcome for a just transition to be vi uh, viable in your community? Goshia, uh, let's start on that one with you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, there are multiple challenges uh, that we need to overcome in the Central, uh, Central Europe and Western Balkan countries where we are the most active in. And I think that the most prevalent challenge uh, we need to face is the hesitation of the decision makers to enact change. And this actually stems from several reasons. So the first one is that there is a clash between uh, the culture and tradition of those regions that is that is deeply linked with, with coal, with coal extraction versus the needs of today and tomorrow that is reducing greenhouse gas emissions and building a climate neutral economy. Uh, so, so that's one, and we need to be mindful of how, how, what an important role this uh, this sector, this uh, this heavily reliant on coal region, has played in in the history of uh, of those countries uh, and how it contributed to their growth and development. So, we need to respect the people, but at the same time, we need to recognize the need for change and for rapid change. Actually, uh, so another reason is the mm, the fear and lack of uh, trust towards this change. Uh, and I think that this is a very natural human reaction to be to be hesitant, to fear the change. But um, uh, but I think that these are really supercharged in our countries of Central Europe and the Western Balkans, uh, much more than in other regions. And there are reasons for that that, that I will not delve into. But I think that this is a big struggle for us as well. Uh, there's also that kind of tendency of uh, of decision makers to uh, to uh, towards short-term planning and um, and a very, um, I would say, late response to the challenges that we're facing. And we really don't have any time for that. And in order to um, properly conduct this transition, uh, we have to properly plan it first. And if we're going to wait until the very last moment, the chances for this process to be unjust and to deepen the injustices will be much higher. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and then last but not least, 
uh, in light of the war in Ukraine, there's again a high risk for us to stand still or even take a step back um to the old ways so relying on coal uh, on fossil fuels and and coal um and instead of actually taking that leap forward to the green transition uh, so we have to be mindful mindful of that because we really don't have time for it and we already have the solutions this is something that we always repeat we already have the solutions but we need to have a bit more courage to actually implement them well said and uh, fascinating uh, narrative. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on, number three, how did you mobilize people to take action around this issue in your community? Masayoshi, why don't you start? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, as a 350 Japan members, uh, we are uh, trying to do uh, shareholder proposals for the uh, climate action, climate justice, especially for the Japanese three mega banks. If to that uh, bank campaign, uh, we uh, create uh, opportunities to talk about climate disasters and the uh, injustice of fossil fuel projects, uh, talk about the co-benefits of the renewables. So in our bank campaign, we encouraged people to talk with the customer service staff of the three Japanese mega banks, share their opinion with the companies and ask them to um, enhance their climate policies. So the, this year, 124 people, citizens, joined the action to in February of this year, and it was successful. So, so many people um, uh, called uh, the customer service to ask them to enhance the climate policy. And then that was a, a very rare opportunity. Actually, sadly, in Japan, uh, we have a very rare opportunity for the many people to join. But uh, uh, we uh, tried to um, uh, make it happen in our climate justice movement. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well said. Um, what is one piece of advice that you have for uh, folks in attendance who want to get involved in this movement? Angela, would you start on that, that one? Um, sure. So uh, I will say, first off, I'll, do not feel that you are alone. Know that there are others out there like you, other like-minded individuals who may already have organizations started and all you need to do is just reach out uh, complete a volunteer form send an email and i am sure that they will reach back out to you with open arms welcoming you in uh, with many things and need um need boots on the ground uh, for example uh, when the bahia pipeline project when i learned of it uh, i thought what what could I do? As one person, what could I do? So I turned to social media to see what was happening in my community, who was rallying around against this issue. And that's how I found Memphis Community Against Pollution, or at the time it was um, actually Memphis Community Against the Pipeline. And I just reached out, uh, I attended an online meeting, and I just said, well, how can I help? And my first um, interaction was actually picking up trash in the community in the summer sun. And so the, the actions may not be that glamorous, but uh, it's about every small job, every small task, no matter, uh, no matter the size, honestly, it helps. So if you're just, if you're willing and you're ready and you, you have the time to invest and you have the passion, the opportunities are there, the organizations are out there, you are not alone. It's about unity. And we are all here to fight for a common goal. Wonderfully said. Um, it, it provokes me to ask: Does uh, does storytelling play a role in, in your work, uh, Goshia? What do you think on that? Uh, it surely does. Uh, I think that when abstract numbers, financial estimates, and the scientific research results they they fail to make an impact on our communities. I think that the power of storytelling is something that is just so deeply embedded in us humans. 
uh, something that we can ignore and can be much more effective. Uh, and actually what we did in, in Poland, the, one of the countries we're focusing um, with uh, when it comes to our Just Transition program, uh, we have uh, shot and premiered a, a short documentary uh, on the Just Transition process in, in uh, one of the, actually the most coal-reliant region in Poland. It's a story of a young climate activist who's exploring perspectives on just transition. And it turns out that uh, there are so many people from all walks of life, but they share the same goal and uh, uh, they want to enact the just transition. Uh, and I think that, or at least we hope, uh, that we can contribute to a better understanding of this issue among uh, citizens of this, uh, of this region. Uh, and I think that in that way, we can be closer to people's hearts, not only minds, uh, if that makes sense. So uh, I think that this can help us encourage people to actually take responsibility for the future of, of their regions. Yeah, th thank you. Um, and thank you all for a fantastic discussion. Uh, we're going to go now to some questions from the audience. And uh, in order to moderate these questions for you all from the audience, I'm going to pass it now back to Lizzie for that part of the conversation. But before I do, I want to once again say thank you to the passionate and powerful activists on our panel. Masayoshi, Goshia, and Angela, thank you so much. Your work is essential in our fight. And we're very grateful to you for sharing your insights and inspiring others to take action in their own communities. I'll turn it over to Lizzie to put some of uh, your questions to this esteemed panel. But uh, for now, thank you again, and thank you to our participants. Uh, take it away, Lizzie. Thank you so much for that fascinating conversation. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience, so I will get gather those and ask really quickly. Um, let's see, let's start with this one. What did you do to make sure you were incorporating the, vo the voices of the, sorry, <laughs> of the most vulnerable community members? How did you actively involve them in the process? Let's start with Goshia. Um, so uh, we and uh, our work in uh, in Poland and Kosovo, which are our main countries that we focus on when it comes to just transition work, um, we want to make sure that we connect with the local communities and we and we build that community muscle to enact just transition. So in both countries, we, uh, as Climate Reality Europe, we connected with local activists uh, who have the expertise, who have the knowledge, the experience of working in that, uh, in, that, um, uh, in that area already to make sure that we take into account all the vulnerable members who might be worse off because of that change. So I think that the very important element of that work was to really connect with the people on the ground uh, who are involved in those conversations for not uh, for a longer time than even we were. And now what we're trying to do is to build that muscle, as I mentioned, uh, which means that we need to connect these uh, members of the community, especially the ones who are the most vulnerable, uh, listen to them, take into account what, what they have to say, what they fear, and, uh, and then process that and uh, influence the decision makers to take that into account. So what we uh, did two years ago, we actually invited um, local activists, uh, local community members, and uh, non-governmental organizations to comment on a, uh, on a territorial just transition plan, which was developed by the regional decision makers, but we wanted them, the, the local activists, the local uh, citizens, to have a say and comment on that plan. So their voice is heard. And uh, actually what happened is that the, this document was updated uh, in line with the, with the comments that we provided. So we definitely need to always stay in, on the ground, close to the people who are the most impacted and most active in that, in that space. Great, thank you for sharing. Angela, same question to you. How, how did, what did you do to make sure that you were incorporating the voices of the most vulnerable community members? Um, well, it was definitely not a, a me, it was a collective, it was a we thing. 
And it and it all started out with the neighborhood associations. They mm-hmm. were the driving factor behind getting everyone in the in the neighborhood, in the community engaged. Uh, using social media, uh, you had individuals who had maybe graduated and moved on, but they were returning to join in, and it was uh, it incorporated a lot of um, using our social media platforms, Zoom calls, you name it, and then getting out into the actual communities with some traditional old-fashioned canvassing and phone banking and texting people and just meeting everyone where they are or that it was talking to them in a grocery store um, a lot of canvassing of grocery store parking lots um, talking to individuals at grocery stores talking to individuals at church um, striking up conversations at different community events hosting community events rallies marches protests protests there were a lot of uh, creating a lot of opportunities to get that message out there because uh, I would say one of the beauty of the situation is living in the community um, made it easier to have access to other community members who may not have known um, and who may not necessarily um, keep up with everything that was in the news. So just making sure that we were visible and that we were constantly um, having these conversations in our neighborhoods to keep the topic hot and not let the news and the information and the story grow cold. That that was where we how we got the engagement. Great. Thank you. And Masayoshi, how did you how does this work in Japan um, that might be different from other countries? What did you do to make sure you were incorporating the voices of the most vulnerable communities in your work? Thank you very much for your question. Um, in Japan, as you know, uh, we have uh, so many disasters every year, like typhoon, heavy rains, heat waves. So um, in our work, uh, we are trying to uh, be connected with the climate disaster uh, victims, the front runners, and to uh, invite them to speak up uh, about the um, loss and damage caused by the climate disasters, such as typhoon, and then such kind of uh, very powerful voices to uh, demand that climate action uh, are shared. Uh, So such kind of uh, um, uh, sharing their voice, make their voice heard. uh, This is a very important part of our activities. And also, um, we really um, need uh, to um, share the voices from the um, developing countries, such as uh, like uh, Asian countries, because uh, uh, we know that uh, there are so many uh, climate vulnerable uh, area. And also, uh, we know that the Japanese government and the Japanese business industries are still trying to export fossil fuel infrastructures. So uh, they uh, try, uh, the Japanese government and industry group is try, are trying to justify uh, using the ammonia or hydrogen coal firing technology, but it is a totally false solutions. So we need to accelerate the just transition to the 100% renewables. So uh, such kind of the uh, uh, first solution uh, like um, ammonia co-firing or uh, CCUS or uh, this kind of first solutions are very uh, not not useful uh, to uh, actually achieve the uh, 1.5 trajectory uh, for the climate justice. So um, we uh, have a network. Uh, we are the global. NGO, uh, we have a network, so uh, we tried to be connected with the um, uh, climate warriors uh, fighting for the climate justice, and uh, they we try to make their voice heard uh, in Japan too. Great, thank you. Okay, um, one another question from the audience: In an ideal world. What resources would you have to further the impact of your work? 
Angela, let's start with you. That is an excellent question. And <laughs> I would say first and foremost, the, um, the primary resource would be additional dollars properly allocated to um, communities and neighborhoods such as mine so that uh, we have the ability to better engage residents, better educate residents, uh, that everyone would feel supported in a fashion uh, where they feel they can stand strong against these companies. Because it it's not impossible, but it can be a bit daunting to go against these million dollar corporate corporations who threaten your community uh, and just show this this complete and utter lack of of genuine concern. So I feel that by having the proper funding available and it's uh, being allocated justly to these areas or to our areas that are in need, uh, we would have the, the financial backing to further our work and our missions. And Masayoshi, how about for your work? If you had a magic wand to give you all of the resources you needed, what would you use that for? Thank you very much. This is a very, very important, uh, interesting question <laughs> because the Japanese civil society organizations are facing difficulties to um, get uh, enough resources to take action in our movement. But uh, let me see that, um, especially uh, in Japan, uh, we are living in a very unbalanced and uh, society of the injustice uh, in terms of the uh, gender uh, justice, intergenerational justice, uh, racial justice. So uh, maybe uh, we need to, uh, uh, we need a power, uh, people power to um, uh, reclaim power uh, to uh, realize uh, uh, social justice uh, in uh, various accept, uh, aspect in our society. So the, uh, actually we don't have uh, money, uh, we don't have uh, a political power, of course, so maybe we need, uh, we, our, our strength is a uh, uh, number, uh, the power of the people uh, in terms of the democracy. So um, we need to uh, try to expand our uh, voices. Uh, we need to increase our supporters. So uh, such kind of the, uh, people power uh, will be the uh, resources uh, I want to uh, have to uh, for the climate justice. Great, thank you yeah, for of sharing. Course, uh, um, we already have, uh, but uh, we need more. So, yes, I mean. <laughs> and Goshia, how about for you in Europe? What resources are you lacking that you wish you could tap into more? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I think I would, on the pragmatic side, I think I would agree with uh, with Angela on the funding. I think that as uh, people who want to um, want to enact just transition, we are actually facing an industry that with almost unlimited money. Uh, so this clearly in, impacts this whole situation, and we are in a bit of an unfair position uh, facing them. Uh, so I think that's one. I think that definitely. Another that I would mention would be to have more support of the media so, so we can reach more people and actually help them better understand the challenge we're facing. I think that uh, there's still more space for the media to, to, to join the climate movement, that's for sure. Um, and for famous people to actually, uh, to actually um, advocate for climate in ways that are true and real, not just in, in a way that they sometimes do as in greenwashing. So that's another one. But I also thought about it uh, differently when thinking about resources. I think that um, if we could treat courage and hope as resources too, I think that we would also need those. Apart from the very pragmatic ones, I think that if we try to look at it a bit differently, not literally, I think that these are also the resources we need uh, to, to enact that change. 
Great. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Angela. Uh, Angela, could you talk about the importance of storytelling in a real life fight against the Bahia pipeline? Well, um, storytelling is is everything. Um, I can't remember which uh, of my esteemed panelists mentioned that, but they are right. Storytelling is everything. It uh, for I would say, for example, for me hearing about the Bahia pipeline, uh, you don't truly know how harmful and how hurtful it is until you meet the people that it was going to most impact in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood, and realize that they were going to lose their land. There were mm -hmm. two, a couple of families that own land, and we're talking about land that was being passed down from generation to generation. That these these two corporations were threatening and fighting hard to take away. And I feel that their stories, the, and then in, 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 in addition to hearing their stories and hearing them tell their stories along with the, their facial expression, you can see the hurt on their face and, and, the, and the anger in their eyes. Uh, to me, that's, that's powerful. It, it puts a face to what is happening. You can't turn a blind eye to families who are being hurt and threatened, especially uh, to families that this this is not new. And this is a historical thing where you have African-American and Black families that are consistently being attacked by these types of entities who feel that they are valid in their reasons to. So it just hearing these stories, seeing these people constantly in their faces, it puts uh, things into a different perspective. And I don't know what government official uh, or what local or state or any type of government official could ignore something like that. And what individual could ignore the power of hearing and seeing these individuals' pain that these facilities were causing. So yes, storytelling is very important. Well, thank you for sharing. I think the stories coming out of uh, the Bahalia pipeline have been incredibly impactful for me personally as, a, as an American citizen. And, and I know that uh, the stories coming out of Europe and Japan are equally inspiring. And I'm excited to see all the stories today from around the globe that people are sharing as part of this 24 hours event. So to close one final question for all of you, we are, you know, focusing this year's 24 hours event on solutions and hope. And so I'd love to hear from you. What gives you hope in the work that you do? And Goshi, I'll start with you. Mm, I think that connecting with people, and that's something I mentioned uh, uh, when I was answering the question about one advice that we could give. I think that connecting with people who are fighting for the same cause that are like minded. Uh, is something that, well, it's just a renewable resource to, to just get that kind of hope and courage and uh, enthusiasm from others. So, so I think that this is, uh, this is something that gives me hope. There's more and more people who want to be involved in that movement uh, and who really understand how, um, how serious the situation is that we're in right now. And I think that, yeah, this is something that gives me hope. Great. And Masayoshi, how about for you? What gives you hope? Mm. Uh, let me say, firstly, um, despair turns, uh, of course, uh, courageous. So the uh, I do think that uh, uh, if we face the reality of the climate crisis, or climate emergency, or climate catastrophe, uh, maybe uh, in the very beginning, we need to be in despair, maybe. So, because the, uh, we need to uh, understand the latest science knowledge, scientific knowledge. So, there are so many um, serious, serious uh, facts in the uh, like IPCC report. So, uh, maybe that should be the starting point. But of course, we need hope. We need to have a, a solution for the tomorrow. So uh, what gives me hope is that uh, um, 
all of you and uh, your work, uh, your activities uh, all over the world, of course. And also, uh, I know that uh, there are so many uh, bottom-up grassroots movement all over the world. And also, the taking action is a source of hope. So, I maybe the firstly uh, the action is taken, then uh, there will be a uh, hope. So, mm. um, I do uh, believe that uh, um, uh, all of you and the, I know there are uh, millions of uh, climate uh, activists uh, work uh, on the street in in the town to uh, demand the climate uh, climate dimension uh, to the government or fossil industry uh, for example like uh, um maybe uh, cop 27 is, is approaching right uh, it is a uh, african cop and then i know that uh, there are so many african climate activists are fighting for the uh, symbolic uh, fossil project so-called ecop east african crude oil pipeline project so uh, this is the very very uh, big uh, fossil project and then it will emit a large large amount of co2 in, in the future uh, which is locked in the african uh, society uh, so that uh, there are so many youth activists or uh, local uh, leaders of the uh, climate uh, community, climate justice community, uh, speak up uh, the, uh, to sp stop eco. And I know that the Japanese banks is supporting such a uh, project, eco project, actually. Uh, for example, like Sumitomo Mitsui, uh, Sumitomo Mitsui, uh, SMBC is the uh, one of the uh, largest uh, Japanese bank is supporting uh, ECOP as a financial advisor to the total energy. So uh, maybe it is uh, it is a project in Africa, but uh, it is uh, strongly connected with the uh, Japanese uh, economy and the Japanese society. So as a uh, Japanese, uh, as a member of the Japanese society, um, I strongly uh, uh, hope that uh, uh, we need to take action uh, from Japan for the uh, climate activists in Africa. So such kind of that solidarity uh, will be the source of hope. And then uh, conversation between us will be the source of hope. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, keep uh, taking action. So that that is my message. Thank you. Thank you. And Angela, how about for you? What gives you hope in your work? I would say it is knowing that, and and have actually today was really reconfirming that this problem that we are facing it transcends race, it transcends gender, it transcends any type of social construct that is built to keep us separated and that we can unite together on the, under this and that creating this form of unity, us connecting from across the country, across the world, um, that to me, that gives hope. Great. Well, thank you so much. All of you give me hope in the work that we do here at Climate Reality and I, I'm so appreciative of you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to just thank you again, Masayoshi, Goshia, Angela, and of course, Mr. Gore for joining us. And thank all of you for being here and being part of this conversation. I, If you're able, I would invite you to stick around for our next Global Dialogue, which will be starting shortly. And that one will be on the topic of how we can expand zero emission vehicles and transit. And of course, I also wanna invite you to continue to be part of 24 Hours of Reality today by checking out the stories of people just like you who are taking action on climate all around the world. You can find those stories on our Instagram, which is at Climate Reality. And of course, by visiting our website, which is www.24hoursofreality.org. 
Thank you so much for joining. Thank you to all our panelists for an amazing conversation this today, this morning here in the United States in the evening and other afternoon elsewhere around the globe. I hope you all have a great day and we'll see you soon for our next global dialogue. Thanks so much.